Okay, so um, I think we are online, we're live on YouTube. So I think we can start. Okay, so uh, so thank you guys for being here today. Uh, today we have the pleasure to receive Professor Steve Campbell from Dublin. Uh, he's going to give us a short tour um, of quantum speed limits. So Steve, thank you very much and you may start whenever if you're ready. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, yeah, so I think when I were deciding what to, what to chat about, I thought I'd, I'd go with what I'm kind of a little bit known, known for over the last couple of years and just look at a few different aspects of quantum speed limits. So without pre presuming too much knowledge, I mean, I know Lucas is an expert, um, but uh, maybe for those maybe a little bit less sure, I'm going to sort of split the talk into two basic parts. So the first half roughly is gonna really just be a sort of historical overview of where quantum speed limits came from, why I find them uh, interesting. And really it, it should be a reasonably easy, gentle introduction that hopefully everyone will follow. My main aim here is just to kind of just impart a little bit of the excitement that I have for why I think they're really, really interesting concept to, to study. And then in the second half I'll talk, I'll just give a sort of flash in the pan uh, of a couple of the, the things that I've done with them. So a few different areas that I've applied them. In particular, one which is like looking at speed limits in many body systems with a sort of focus on quantum control. So I think it's a really interesting area for it. Um, and then the other uh, more recent work where we're trying to sort of unpick a little bit what it, even what these quantum speed limits mean when we look at more general dynamics, because it becomes very subtle whenever you start trying to define these things for you know beyond unitary dynamics and you look at something like, a, like an open system. It gets very, very tricky. So there's, there's lots, lots of work that we're, we're trying to figure out. So with this, uh, I kick into the first, first bit, which is just a bit of background. So let's break ourselves in super gently uh, and think about well, where does the quantum speed limit come from in the first place? Really, it's an expression of the, the un uncertainty principle. So if we go back to our quantum mechanics 101, I like putting this slide up because I think everyone has seen something like this before. So we have that the uncertainty principles are really what I would call the indeterminacy principles. They capture the, uh, like a, the, the intrinsic fuzziness of quantum mechanics. The fact that you can't know with pre absolute precision one quantity without sacrificing uh, a certain amount of precision in another, this is kind of baked into the very essence of quantum mechanics. And if we go back to Heisenberg's original papers, so we we'll go back to what he, uh, what he wrote down, you'll see that in his original definition, like he had these two, two expressions. He had the position momentum uncertainty relation, so relating the on the, the variance of the of uh, the momentum times the variance of the position was bounded by roughly h bar, and you know he was not particularly precise. He had this kind of like it's roughly of this order, um, and at the same time he also gave us the energy time uncertainty relation. Now this was a great fundamental insight. The fact though that it was a little bit wiggly, a little bit unclear. Um, this was very quickly taken care of because while, you know, in our standard courses on quantum mechanics, we learn about like a Heisenberg's insight by, you know, something like the Heisenberg micro, the, the gamma ray microscope or something like this. But what we very quickly learn when we actually dig into what the uncertainty principles are is that it, it arises from a more fundamental property of quantum mechanics, and that is the non-commutativity. And so it was a couple of years later, um, when, when Robertson, so we'll talk a little bit about it, when Robertson kind of formalized the uncertainty principle um, in terms of this non-commutativity that we really understood what, uh, where, where, where the intrinsic uncertainty in quantum mechanics comes from. But what I find fascinating about the, the history of, of the, like, so if we just follow this thread of where quantum speed limits come from, so we go back like, some of the big debates between Einstein and Bohr were trying to unpick the, the, the nature of, of uncertainty. And so, like I say, I mean, position momentum was kind of made a little bit more concrete, but it, a lot of the arguments between Einstein and Bohr centered around the discussions on the energy time uncertainty principle. It was accepted somehow that this was a correct statement, but then Einstein was picking, picking uh, holes in it. And what, what he had was this really interesting little thought experiment. So this is one of, one of, the, one of the arguments he had. He came up with this, this idea. He said, well, imagine I have a box with some, you know, of some mass, it's got some energy or whatever associated, there's some photons bunching around inside it. And I attach a little aperture here that's controlled by a clock. When the clock strikes a given time, that will open and some photons will escape. 
So then from here, I can determine precisely what the change in energy is by the escape photons. And then from here, I can determine precisely what the change. Uh, so what I can determine what the change in mass was, and then I can determine what the, what the associated change in energy was. And he said, essentially here, what he's saying is, well, this happens at a precise time. I can determine precisely what the, what the change in energy is. Then this would appear to negate the energy time uncertainty principle. Bohr had a counter argument. Um, but we have to appreciate that his counter argument relied on the fact that it was 1920s and we hadn't invented digital clocks at this point. And so his argument was that, in fact, in order to determine this time precisely, you would need to know the position and the momentum of the hands of the clock. And therefore, these, you know, this, the uncertainty associated here was enough to recover the, the energy time uncertainty principle. So, you know, kind of came around with a kind of roundabout way to give us the energy time uncertainty relation. And in fact, this is very often how the energy time uncertainty relation is kind of first introduced. If you pick up standard textbooks, um, it's presented in uh, very often in this manner as a, I find almost as like a corollary to the, to the position momentum uncertainty relation. And that's, I mean, that's wrong, <laughs> as we will see. But a naive derivation of the, of the, uh, of the energy time uncertainty relation can come from, from thinking about a simple wave packet. So imagine I have a wave packet moving, moving with some velocity. The fact that it's, you know, this wave packet has some spatial spread, it has some uncertainty in its position, then if I'm talking about the time it takes for it to get past a particular point, the front of the wave packet will hit it first, the back of the wave packet will hit it last. So there's some uncertainty mm -hmm. in what we define as the time at which that wave packet passed a specific point. So we have an uncertainty in the position will have a knock on effect as the uncertainty in time. So that this sort of makes sense when we think about things as wave packets. By the same token, if I have a wave packet, there's an uncertainty of the uncertainty in the position. There's also an associated uncertainty in its momentum. And the fact that there's an uncertainty in that momentum of that wave packet then naturally means there's also an uncertainty in the in the energy by by definition. So you can flesh out what this uncertainty is. And what you'll see is that the position, uh, sorry, the, the, the energy time uncertainty relation is exactly the same. If you multiply these two equations together, you get exact that they're exactly equal. So you can kind of see that the energy time uncertainty principle um, can kind of follow on from the, the position momentum uncertainty principle in this very naive kind of hand wavy way. But this is very much so unsatisfactory whenever we actually look at where the uncertainty principle comes from, where um, the position momentum relation comes from. And like this was put on a rock solid foundation by Robertson back in 1929. Now, anyone who has not read Robertson's paper immediately after the seminar, go to the go to Fis, FISRO and download it and read it. It's one page. This is the entirety of the article and it changed how we understood uh, really physical processes, I think. Um, Completely. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful example of really sort of a mathematician coming along and just crystallizing what we want to know. By, um, and so the issue, the issue essentially was that Heisenberg gave us the position momentum um, statement, but it was, you know, it was sort of hand wave. It wasn't really very, very cleanly defined. It was Robertson, who then using, let's say, some tricks like uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and the fact that we have operators so that we have, we're dealing with matrices rather than numbers and the non-commutativity of matrices, what we find is that you can use this relationship to precisely define the uncertainty relation. And so now the fact that physical uh, like position momentum correspond to matrices. So we develop matrix mechanics. The fact that they're described by operators and the fact that operators don't commute then gives us the uncertainty principle as a direct crawler. So that just follows directly from here. So this puts a rock solid foundation on, on, on the uncertainty principle, which, okay, I'll skip over. Uh, like this is essentially how Robertson goes about defining the, the uncertainty relation for position and momentum. So it's you take two matrices, the, the, this variance of the matrices, you can define using a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And from here, the, the, precise, the precise form, the Robertson inequality drops out. This is beautiful when it comes to observables, because we know what the operators are for X and P. Whenever we think about it in terms of the, of, of the energy time uncertainty relation, which again has the same sort of flavor to it, 
we run into immediately a problem because we don't have a time operator. So we can't write down the, we are, we, uh, on its first, let's say, first looking at it, it doesn't look like we can write down the, or use the same logic in order to justify why the energy time uncertainty relation makes sense. And that's really how it remained for about 20, 20, 20 or so years. So observe, like the uncertainty in quantum mechanics was made really fundamental um, and was given a rock solid mathematical foundation by, by Robertson. But whenever we think about the physical interpretation, it only applied, let's say, or it only really made sense to physical observables, to things that we could measure, that we could associate a, a Hermitian operator to. So then when it comes to something like the energy time uncertainty relation, the fact that we don't have a time operator made under, sorry, let's say, interpreting the energy time uncertainty relation very tricky. And really, people didn't think about it or, well, didn't make much progress on it for about 20 years. And this is where quantum speed limits then come from. So Mandelstam and Tam, two Russian, Russian physicists, uh, they were the ones who first kind of came back and revisited the energy time uncertainty relation and actually gave it a proper physical foundation. Now, I, I this is an old slide I pulled together. Um, whenever I was you know, looking up uh, images of Mandelson and Tam, the interesting things you find from Wikipedia, it turns out that they both have moon craters named after them. So this is an image of, of the Mandelstam moon crater and this is the Tam moon crater up there. So, you know, why not? But what the... What, what did they do? And like, where, where was, uh, I think, Mandelson and Tam's uh, great insight that, that really led to quantum speed limits? What I love is that they, they actually took exactly the same, um, the same rationale. They, uh, they showed that the energy time uncertainty relation can be sort of explained or interpreted or understood in terms of this fundamental non-commutativity, this, this, uh, by the same tools that the uncertainty relation, uh, the traditional uncertainty relation uses, they just sort of gave it a, the, the proper interpretation. What they said was, okay, energy time uncertainty relation, well, how, how can we try and, how can we try and, and, and pick this guy apart? Well, they started from you know, basically a fundamental equation for, for the, the, the Neumann equation for how an operator evolves. I have some operator A, and we know already that the Hamiltonian, that's what defines our energy. So it makes sense if we want to make sense of the energy time and certainty relation that our Hamiltonian is going to appear somewhere. And they start from here. And so you see already we have a commutator associated to, um, with, with this operator. From here, you can bound this guy, this commutator, using the uh, Robertson uncertainty relation. So you can get a relationship between this side of the equal sign and this side of the equal sign, basically using Robertson. So you can just plug in the numbers. This is nothing but essentially the Robertson uncertainty relation. So far, so fairly standard. So far, something that could have been done 20 years ago had anyone sat down and thought a little bit about it. Then what they said was, okay, what is this equation good for? Well, it's good for determining the time evolution, the unitary time evolution of my quantum state. If A is my density operator, if I plug in my initial state here, if A is just this outer product, that's just my density matrix at the initial time, pure state, fine. Then I can plug this guy into these relationships and what drops out after I do a little bit of integration is this expression. Now, I find this very flippant little uh, remark that, you know, you know, I don't know if this is standard in sort of like old style Russian uh, theoretical physics papers, but they talk about how, you know, this little guy is, you know, it can be easily integrated and off they go and do it. So they find some weird trigonometric identity that I think, you know, I don't know, maybe they were told as a bedtime story when they were five or something and they remembered it. And that's, that's how they got their, their, their integration out. But what happens by doing this is that you end up with this expression here. So you end up with something which is the variance of the Hamiltonian times, and now we just have the time, just the amount of time that this time evolution has been ran for. Remember, this, oper this equation just tells us the time evolution of this operator A. So when we do this integration, we get this expression, and then there's just one little step, which is they say, okay, let's, Basically, they, they say, well, if I were to talk about the initial state evolving into an orthogonal state, what this term is, this is the expectation value of my original operator of A, which is my initial state density matrix, 
the time average, the, the expectation value at time t, so over the evolved state. So if you actually look at what that guy is, it's psi zero, psi t. So it's just the overlap between the initial state and the time evolved state. They said, well, what happens if I look at uh, something like orthogonal states? This term disappears, and then what drops out is that I have the time required for the state to reach an orthogonal state is going to be pi over two divided by the variance times h bar. And this is what the first quantum speed limit was. And what I find amazing or really beautiful here is that they have taken the original, let's say, I mean, the, 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 the original uncertainty principle, and they've looked at it in the kind of proper way to, to, to show that what the energy time uncertainty relation was not to be interpreted in the same way as the position momentum and let's say, let's say standard uncertainty relations, things that are to do with measurable quantities, the energy time uncertainty relation is fundamentally different. It is related to something like the intrinsic time scales, the, the, the time scales that the system naturally will want to evolve according to some, to whatever its Hamiltonian is. So rather than being something about how accurately you can determine the energy and how accurately you can determine an energy at that particular time, it has, it's not to do with that. It's to do with how, how fast the system naturally will want to evolve according to um, given, it, given, some, given the uncertainty in the energy, given the, its energy spread. So I love this, this, this interpretation. And this would have been fine, and this would have been it and done. You know, we would have had a nice, clean understanding of the energy time uncertainty relation if it weren't for another uh, 40 years later. People didn't think too much more about it, really, uh, let's say from this sort of practical side. And then Margolos and Leventon came along and they asked a similar question. But this time, unlike Mandelson and Tam, who really looked at it from the uncertainty principle point of view, they started from the Robertson uncertainty relation, they looked at the von Neumann equation and they worked out what the energy time uncertainty relation means. Margulis and Levenden approached it from a different viewpoint. They were not interested in anything fundamental to do with uncertainty. They were just interested in how fast do things evolve. So if you go to this paper that they had in the 90s, they were asking the pragmatic question about how fast can you get a, a quantum system to do a thing? They were talking about in the context of computation. And so where they started from, and I'll not go through the details here, they started from a similar sort of, uh, rather than that von Neumann equation, they just take standard, even you know, more basic Schrodinger evolution. And they said, well, look, here's how it evolves. I can solve the Schrodinger equation for how it evolves. It gives me my Hamiltonian in like, you know, some unitary operator. And again, they found they had some random or the sort of reasonably, I think, obscure trigonometric identity that allowed them to put a bound when they did the integration and they did the time evolution and they looked at how long it would take for an initial state to evolve to a given state. Using some trigonometric identity, they were able to put a bound on that time. What is amazing and what dropped out from, from this approach, from not asking anything to do with the uncertainty, not asking anything to do with non-commutativity, really just vanilla Schrodinger evolution, was that they got a, uh, a very similar bound on how fast the system can evolve, but this time it was related to the average of the energy rather than the variance of the energy. This was a little bit tricky to understand because we had two bounds on the same thing, but related to two different properties of the system. I mean, not completely dis distinct. One was the variance of the energy, one was the average of the energy, but nevertheless, they were two distinct bounds on the, on the, same, on the same thing. It took quite a while to sort of flesh this out or to understand it. And in fact, what you end up finding is that when these bounds are saturated, it corresponds to when the variance is equal to the energy. And so when the bounds are saturated, they're actually equivalent. But what I find that was kind of remarkable about what um, I think Margulis and Leventon highlighted was that, you know, the quantum speed limit that Mandelson and Tam give us you know, the fact that it gives this notion of an intrinsic time scale for a system to evolve, and they talk about a distance to, to going to an orthogonal state, there are other ways of viewing that same question. And so that's what Mandelson or what Margulis and Leventon did. They, they looked at it from just the sort of pragmatic thing of how fast, how long does it take a system to go from point A to point B? That's a very well-defined problem, regardless of whether or not you're dealing with quantum or classical systems. Like how fast can a thing go from point A to point B? That's something that we deal with constantly. And you don't need to rely on anything particularly uh, deep and, and insightful from quantum mechanics to answer that question. And in fact, 
that's where in this, you know, it's a couple of years ago now, in the review that we did, where we started to sort of dig into this, this question a little bit more. And we'll, I guess what I'll do in the next sort of 20, 30 minutes or so, is just talk about a few of the, the things that I've looked at and some of the, the interesting bits that drop out when you start adding, like pushing these quantum speed limits uh, in particular instances, seeing, well, what can we learn from, from, from studying them? So, and in fact, uh, do I do it on this slide? No. So what I, what I will just say before I move on to here is that that notion, like what Mandel or what Margulis and Leventon did in looking at just, well, how fast does the system evolve? Uh, as I said, there's nothing uniquely quantum mechanical about that question. And in fact, what was shown and has been shown since is that you can reinterpret all of these quantum speed limits in a purely geometric way. And the ge you know, using geometry, then you're just defining distances and speed. I mean, speed is distance over time. So this becomes a very easy way to define a, a sort of quantum speed limit in terms of how, how far something has traveled in a given amount of time. That is, again, that is not a uniquely quantum picture to have. So the fact that you know, distances can be just as well defined in classical systems as in quantum systems, then the natural question emerges as like, well, what's so quantum about a quantum speed limit? And I guess at the very end, I'll maybe touch back on this a little bit to sort of say, well, we're trying to understand like, what is it that makes quantum speed limits quantum versus their very recently defined uh, classical uh, extensions? Because this same approach that we have, uh, whenever you take quantum speed limits from the original definitions, uh, like the, the motivation of Mandelson and Tam in terms of, terms of fundamental uncertainty versus the same relationships that you can get by looking purely at the geometry of the states, um, you can then try and pick apart well, what's really intrinsically quantum about them. So we'll get to that a little bit now, but let's say that was just a sort of flash in the pan background on where quantum speed limits came from and, and like, well, some of the, some of the little little interesting bits I find. So, if you're interested a little bit more, I would uh, go to that review paper, and you know you can sort of you know. And then there's been tons and tons of work has been done done since. Okay, so where where I came in, and really where my my love of uh, of quantum speed limits came from, was actually looking at a sort of complementary problem. Uh, I had uh, started thinking about controlling quantum systems. So, Im so uh, imagine that you know, we, we, we want to manipulate, a, let's say, a system. so I, I'm a, a simple man. I like to live in the world of like one qubit and one oscillator. So if I can do a problem with, with a qubit, I do a problem with a qubit. Um, and my favorite model, therefore, has to be the landau Zener. So, so incredibly elegantly simple, yet it captures an awful lot of physics. So what the landau Zener model tells us, so I have some, some fixed energy gap here some delta, and then I'm just interested in ramping the system with this, this G. So I apply some field and I'm gonna ramp it. Now, what this would mean is if I start the system, let's say in its ground state here, and I ramp this value of G, and I wanna go all the way and stay in this, this ground state all the way to some final value of G, if I do this sufficiently slowly, then I will stay always in the ground state. That's what the adiabatic theorem tells us. If I do go sufficiently slowly, and there's a very precise way of defining what sufficiently slowly is. But let's say in practical terms, we may want to do this process faster. So it doesn't matter. You can pick if you're doing like a, a, I don't know, some sort of metrology protocol, you might need to do this. Or if you're doing state preparation or computation, many reasons why you might want to be able to do this. Um, and generally, you don't want to do it on adiabatic timescales, because like I say, adiabatic timescales are dictated by what this minimum gap is. And so if you have to go really slowly, it's not optimal. So there's been lots of work done in trying to determine ways in which we can achieve the same process just faster. And one way is using uh, what's called counter-diabatic driving, which is a, a form of this, this thing called a shortcut to adiabaticity. What it involves is having my original Hamiltonian, and then I have to work out a particular form of a control term that I add to it. So I take uh, some aspects of the eigenstate, so how the eigenstate I'm interested in controlling, how it changes in time, and I calculate this outer product. And then if I sum these guys up, what I'll get is this, what we call this counter-diabatic driving term. So if I add this Hamiltonian to this guy, what's quite, quite remarkable is that I, I can stay I can do this ramp arbitrarily fast 
without getting any excitations. So I basically can circumvent what the, the adiabatic theorem would tell me should, should be happening. Now, why am I telling you this all in, in the context of speed limits? Well, if I do this, it, it appears because it mimics an adiabatic process, this, the energy I have at the start and the energy I have at the end are exactly the same as I would have in an adiabatic process. It seems like it's thermodynamically for free, at least naively. So you stay like the energy here and the energy there is, is, it is exactly the same as you would have if you did an infinitely slow adiabatic process. So although I'm achieving it in a finite time, it seems like the control maybe was, was thermodynamically for free. And this is really where me and, and uh, Sebastian Defner over in the US, I was visiting him back in sort of 2016 that we started thinking about this. And we were like, well, does that make sense? And I think naturally it doesn't. I mean, you, the fact that you're able to speed up the dynamics by adding this additional Hamiltonian term, there is some penalty that you're paying. And so we were interested in sort of formalizing this a little bit more. That's really where my first interest in the quantum speed limit came from. Because Sebastian had done a lot of work in fleshing out, well, precisely how do you define quantum speed limits uh, for, let's say, arbitrary sort of dynamics. And I had thought about ways of defining a, a, a cost, like how do you quantify how, how energetically costly this control term is? If you think about it, I mean, what you're doing here is I have my original Hamiltonian and I add an energy to it in order to speed up the dynamics. I had a very specific type of energy to it. I had a very particular form of Hamiltonian to it. But at the end of the day, it's just a Hamiltonian. It's just an energy I'm adding. Sebastian's framework for defining the speed limit was based on the sort of operator norms of the, of the Hamiltonians. Because remember, the, the original quantum speed limit, the, the variance of the Hamiltonian, that guy uh you know that that's what the quantum speed limit is yeah or can, can i interrupt you sure 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 oh, because because in the last slide if these auxiliary uh hamiltonium it looks like to me that it, it's time dependent yes or am i missing something no 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 it's uh, everything here would be time dependent i think well um <clears throat> because so if would... it's time dependent then why, why why should i not use um Dyson series to compute ah, the so, whole yeah. state. I have a little little note here that's like uh, this 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 exponential should be properly time ordered, right? Yeah, so, yeah, that's that's my point. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, I I didn't have time to fix this. Like this should be a properly time ordered um, evolution. Ah. So ah, okay, this, okay, Hamiltonian, okay. So, yeah. this Hamiltonian is changing in time. The corresponding auxiliary Hamiltonian is, is changing in time as well in a complementary way. And if you do the correct <laughs> time ordering evolution here, then what happens is that the time evolved state is precisely the instantaneous eigenstate of the original oh. Hamiltonian. So it counteracts any excitations that you would get. It sort of bats them back down and you stay perfectly along this, this, this uh, eigenstate. Now, what we were interested in, like what we wanted to understand then is, well, this process you can do essentially arbitrarily fast by adding this, this auxiliary Hamiltonian in. So there should be some, some sort of energetic trade-off between them. And really, that's what we sort of formalized. What we looked at was we calculated Sebastian's quantum speed limit, so exactly what we were defining before. The fact that you can define a quantum speed limit either in terms of this you know, uncertainty principle picture or this geometric picture. So if you use the fact that you just have a distance in state space, I'm going from this state to this state, you can define a distance and operator norms like trace distance norm. These are perfectly valid distance metrics. You can use that in order to define a speed. And then you can, you know, uh, the details are not so, so vital. You can then define the, the like, well, you can define a quantum speed limit. You can determine how fast this, this dynamics is going according to this, to this metric. What was very nice was we looked at this for various different uh, ramp speeds. So we have that the, the, is there a lot of noise from somewhere? Yeah, Pedro, I, I think you can close Norton's microphone because probably he opened it. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's done now. Oh, yeah, all right, Dorian. Thank you. So, so what, what we what, what what we looked at was you know where we we applied this to 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 the base to the basic problem. We have this two level system. We start in some some eigenstate here, and what our target is is to ramp to this final state going through this avoided crossing. And we want to do it in arbitrary times. 
So we look at it for different ramp durations. Now, what adiabatic theorem tells us is that if we go sufficiently slow, if we take a ramp duration that's really big, we should be able to get, we should be able to do it with, without getting any excitations. We calculate the, the magnitude of the control term using this, this norm. And then we plot, we use, we use this to, to determine what this, oop, what this quantum speed limit is. And what we find is that when you're far away from the avoided crossing in this region, stupid iPad. <laughs> um, when you're far away from the, the, this avoided crossing, regardless of what the ramp duration is, basically this quantum speed limit was always the same. Like the, the, the bound that we were getting was always exactly the same. What this essentially indicated was that <coughs> all processes, regardless of how fast we were doing them, were essentially, you know, uh, adiabatic. They were all basically at the, the they're basically all kind of going as fast as, as you needed to go pretty much. These things only started changing whenever we got into this region where we were near the avoided crossing, where there was this sort of transition where the magnitude, in fact, what was related to was the magnitude of this, of this control. So how big this Hamiltonian term became entered sort of non-trivially into what the speed of the, of the dynamics was. In fact, what's happening here is this auxiliary term is pushing the energy levels apart, which then means that you can drive the system faster where the energy gaps are made larger. And the fact that you can drive them faster is then reflected in the behavior of the quantum speed limit. So the quantum speed limit is sensitive to, to essentially to these spectral features. And so what was, what was nice, you, you could kind of see where the need for control kind of kicked in. You had these kind of minimums uh, behavior in the, in the speed, and you would peak where the control was at its most necessary, where the gap got the smallest. This is where the need for control was somehow the, the, the highest. So the main takeaway here was just that, you know, by asking the question, by looking at the quantum speed limit and looking at it in the context of quantum control, it allowed us to kind of understand a little bit more uh, how the, the, this trade-off between how, how costly your control was in terms of the magnitude of this energy you have to invest, and then how fast you were doing the dynamics. The faster you wanted to go, the more you had to pay in terms of this auxiliary Hamiltonian. So getting this larger speed corresponded to this really big cost that you had to pay. So this is this basically this, this trade-off. So this we thought was nice, but there was something that, that you know, was sort of hanging there that we didn't get a chance to dig into. And it took us a couple of years before we came back around to it. And that was looking at, at um, some of the features that we were seeing in, this, in the Lando Zener model was sort of reminiscent of something called the kibble zurich mechanism. So now, if you're not familiar with kibble zurich mechanism, this is essentially, a, a, I guess, a kind of reinterpretation or redefinition of, of the adiabatic theorem to a more precise way. It's to do with critical systems and ramping through a phase transition. And so then this is another reason why I love the Lando Zener model so much. It's a two level system with an avoided crossing, but nevertheless, the fact that that gap closes and then reopens is characteristic of what happens in like second order phase transitions. In fact, it's almost exactly the same as what happens in like the easing model, the sort of standard critical workhorse that we look at. So what kibble Zurich tells us is that, well, sorry, no, what the adiabatic theorem tells us is that if the energy gap is large and I ramp the system sufficiently slowly, and sufficiently slowly is basically proportional to one over that energy gap. If the rate at which I'm changing the ramp is smaller than the inverse of the energy gap, the system has enough time to kind of stay in its ground state. It might get a little bit of an excitation, but I'm ramping it so slowly that that energy gap is so big that it'll just relax back down. It'll just stay, basically stay in its, in its ground state. What... Zurich really uh, was the person who, who came along and, and, and formalized it. What he realized was that actually what happens at a, at a phase transition where the energy gap closes is that there's going to be a crossover. There's going to be a point, depending on how fast you're ramping the system, where the adiabatic theorem breaks down, where I'm ramping the system too fast. So if I ramp at a constant speed, let's say just a linear ramp, and the gap is closing, at some point, the rate at which I'm ramping that will be faster than one over the energy gap. And that's where there's going to be a transition. And he characterized it in this manner, where we have in here, I'm ramping the system, uh, let's say sufficiently, like the energy gap is quite, quite large. So this is one over the energy gap I'm plotting here. So the energy gap is quite large. And then 
the 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 speed with which the ramp is going is much is is much bigger. So essentially, the system can always heal in this region. The energy gap is so big that everything I do that this this ramp is essentially adiabatic. But at some point, there's a crossover where I'm ramping the system too fast, and I get I'll get some excitation, and any excitation will get stuck up there because but uh, the 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 ramp moves forward too fast. So he characterized this as essentially a crossover between an adiabatic regime where the system essentially the ramp the gap is so big I can just do whatever I want to the system um, and I won't get excitations and the impulse regime <clears throat> where I'm ramping it too fast that essentially uh, he says that the, the dynamics sort of froze out. And okay, so the the specific details then are not so important. I mean, he, he uh, Zurich basically showed that you can relate the the time at which this happens to the underlying critical exponents of the model. So every critical system has these uh, particular critical exponents that characterize all of the different equilibrium properties. What is amazing uh, in what what uh, Zurich has done here was he showed that the dynamical response of the system can be understood purely in terms of its equilibrium properties, in terms of these critical exponents. So depending on how fast I'm ramping the system, which is related to how, uh, how quickly that energy gap is closing, I can understand the response of the system in terms of these critical exponents. The crossover between when it's adiabatic versus impulse is characterized by this. Now, where does quantum speed limits and us uh, fit in? Well, we go back to what we had done with the Landau Zener. And one of the things that we'd been asked about uh, when we first did the paper was that, you know, this, this property, this kind of region here where all of the curves collapsed on top of each other. And we said, like, essentially everything you're doing is adiabatic. And this region where the need for control was significant, this was very reminiscent of the crossover between adiabatic dynamics and impulse and the impulse regime. And so the question was, is there, is there a more concrete, is, is it just... It's a simple, like it's a qubit. So is it that we're dealing with a simple system and this is just coincidental or not? And that's really what we set out to do. Um, so working with uh, Ricardo Puebla, who's like an expert in all things Kibble Zurich, we asked that question. We were like, okay, well, can we understand the, the behavior here of our control dynamics in terms of what the Kibble Zurich mechanism was telling us? And Okay, I mean, the details of what's shown on these plots is not, not, not so vital. Um, the bottom line was that, in fact, we could. Well, our intuition was that that speed limit had a minimum. So there was a point where everything looked adiabatic, and then there's a point where the speed bottomed out, and that's where the need for control kicked in, where they, and then the, the, the magnitude of the control term grew, depending on how fast you were doing it. Um, and then that minimum, we said, that maybe delineates the tr transition between adiabatic and impulse regimes. And what we, what we worked out, we, we looked at the scaling of that minimum point, and that's essentially what Ricardo is plotting here, the scaling of where that minimum occurs uh, as a function of how fast you're doing the ramp. And what should happen was this characteristic um, square root of tau scaling is what Kibble Zurich predicted, and it's exactly what we got that the, the time at which this minimum occurred was, uh, was revealing precisely the, 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 the kibble Zurich scaling that, that one would want. Now, why do I think this is absolutely is remarkable? kibble Zurich is a non-equilibrium property. This is to do with ramping, uh, taking a system and giving it a kick. And depending on how fast you do that ramp, you will get non-equilibrium excitations. You will have some non-equilibrium dynamics. What we are getting here is exactly the kibble Zurich scaling, exactly kibble Zurich um, properties, but from a fully controlled dynamics. Remember, at every instance in the, in the evolution here, the system is in its ground state. There is no excitations anywhere. It is not non, it, it isn't really a non-equilibrium thing. Like we're in the instantaneous eigenstate at all, all inst at all points. But well, this is essentially uh, well, what, what, we, what we argue or what, what, what I think this shows is that the control dynamics can actually be used as a, as a useful window into otherwise non-equilibrium dynamics. So think about it. If I have my control, my, my system I want to control, what this counter-diabatic driving does is that it suppresses all non-equilibrium excitations, regardless of how fast you do the ramp, regardless of what ramp you apply, doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want to the system, and you can always have it in its instantaneous eigen uh, ground state. Let's say for for the problem here. So, by virtue of the fact that you're able to control the system, 
a corollary of that, which is what we validated here, is that by being able to control the system, you implicitly or you automatically learn about the non-equilibrium dynamics that the system would undergo if you weren't controlling the system. Now, I think this is interesting because it takes quantum control and turns it on its head. It takes control and it says, well, rather than being a means to an end, rather than being uh, just a, a, a black box, I say, well, I want to go from state A to state B. Instead, you can actually use the control dynamics to ask non-trivial questions about the non-equilibrium dynamics the system would undergo. And it's incredibly versatile. Like I said, typically the early studies on Kibble Zurich would have looked at the, this scaling for a linear ramp. And then they would have done a separate analysis for a trigonometric ramp or for a different, for any, whatever ramp you wanted. What the controlled approach allows you to do is essentially say, well, no, I've solved the problem. Now I just pick whatever, whatever ramp I want. I can study it in this way and I can, I can understand what the non-equilibrium dynamics would be. So I can ask interesting non-equilibrium questions by studying the control, the control picture. So there was a few subtleties. You can read a little bit more about it. And uh, I think this, this is the paper that we did on, the, on, the, on this kibble zerk scaling in the control dynamics. And really, quantum speed limits were, were integral to this. Like how we got the kibble zerk scaling was by studying the behavior of the speed limit um, for the control dynamics. So you can read a little bit more from, from these papers. Um, I might, uh, so what, I will just mention this, this one other um, paper that, that I have from recently with one of, one of my students where we took the same picture, the same insight essentially, and then used it in order to try and define more efficient control. So remember, achieving this control, like the whole, this whole framework was sort of built on the fact that you had this additional energy term you were adding in, and the magnitude of that was what allowed us to get this, this kibble zerk scaling. We use this kind of insight, the fact that the kibble zurich mechanism splits up your, your dynamical response into an adiabatic regime and an impulse regime. We said, well, actually, what that tells us is that control is only really needed in the impulse regime. So can we make control more efficient without necessarily uh, sacrificing its effectiveness? And that's what we do here. We, we talk about control like, restricted to the impulse regime and ways in which you can make quantum control more efficient. So the main that's a takeaway message here is just to say that looking at the control dynamics and asking the right questions, in particular, applying something like the quantum speed limit to it, opens up a whole bunch of different, I think, interesting avenues, avenues to explore, be it uh, something practical from the side of view of like, how do you make more efficient control or something a little bit more fundamental, like looking at the non-equilibrium response in the systems. Okay. Um, Maybe if you just give me 10 minutes, uh, I, I'll then just flash up a little bit to do with uh, speed limits. So that was a lot of stuff on speed limits in many body systems. I have a few other papers dealing in that direction that I think is, you know, there's lots of interesting stuff still to do with, with it there. But on the flip side, speed limits in open systems is a very, very tricky, tricky question. So where does, where does the, the, the issues kind of arise? Well, if you go back about, so about 10 years ago now, there was extensions of the, the original mode, let's say the original speed limits were defined in terms of uh, various different metrics for different open system dynamics. The, the important part here is that most of these papers really, to, one, to a greater or lesser extent, start from this geometric picture. So you remember, the quantum speed limits that we, that we have, you can define them really from like the uncertainty principle, but this alternative approach in terms of uh, distance measures, in terms of a geometric formulation, is much more, uh, I think, much more versatile. And so that's what the guys used. So there you have these three sort of seminal papers, I would say, that studied um, using different metrics, different ways of bounding the, the, the speed of an of a open system evolution. But what that kind of then highlights is that, and I think um, Lucas here was working on work, worked on this paper a couple of years ago, I mean, it highlights the, the fact that whenever you deal with an open system and you take this geometric approach, there is no unique way of defining it. The fact that you can define a distance in space, um, then that opens up, uh, you can basically pick any, any metric you want and define a quantum speed limit. And in fact, um, Sebastian has basically made a career <laughs> out of defining multitudes of quantum speed limits. And in fact, although in fact, I guess Lucas, you probably take the, the biscuits because you've defined an infinite family in that in that in that paper, right? So <laughs> that's right. yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the main point here is that once I take this geometric approach, I can define a quantum speed limit for every metric. So anyone out there, all you have to do is go to the literature, find a metric that people haven't defined a speed limit for, work it out. All you have to do is apply like a, this Cauchy-Schwartz sort of inequality, and you'll, you'll, then you will have your own speed limit. Bam. You can just tick it off, stick your name on it, and you're done. You have your own speed limit. Um, this is nice, but one of the issues then, I think, um, that comes up is then, well, how do you interpret them? What was what's beautiful about the original motivation, the original speed limits, the Mandelson Tam and, and the Margulis Leventon, is that at least they were related to physical properties of the system. The defining feature was either the average energy or the energy variance. So for unitary dynamics, even this geometric approach becomes equivalent, and you can relate this geometric approach back to a physical property of the system. When I pick open, when I go to open systems and I can define distances in, in whatever way I want, this becomes a lot trickier because every metric will give me a speed limit, but not every metric corresponds to a clear physical property of the system. So in particular, like uh, I, I, I maybe have an example here. I can look at a qubit thermalizing. So this red uh, dash curve is if I just plug a, a, a qubit at some initial state and it's in a thermalizing bath, a Markovian thermalizing bath, this guy will follow this path and reach some final thermal state sitting here on the, on the block, in the block sphere. I can pick a, a distance metric and I can define a quantum speed limit um, in terms of any, uh, in any metric I want. I can define it in terms of the wigner yanez skew information, the Fisher information, trace distance, whatever. All of them will give me a perfectly bona fide quantum speed limit, but what the hell do any of those actually mean? <laughs> I don't have this nice clean interpretation that I do for unitary dynamics that's to do with you know, the, the energy spread or the, the variance of the average energy. So we thought about this a little bit. Um, so there's a, we have a paper where we started saying, well, okay, look at really this very simple, again, simple band, I live in the world of one qubit. We looked at what happens for a thermalizing qubit for various different metrics. We looked at for various different initial states of the system sitting along this this boundary uh, along the, uh, the the block sphere. What do these different the different um, quantum speed limits tell us? And the only thing that really the only meaningful thing that comes out is that if you pick a metric, it fixes a path. So the metric defines what the geodesic is, and that's how the speed limits, the geometric speed limits, are are defined. They're defined in terms of what the geodesic path is. And so the tightness of these things, so that all of these curves are just showing you how tight a given geometric speed limit is. So that's all, all it really, really is telling you. So there are certain initial states where the, the different speed limits are tighter than others. This highlights there's no real hierarchy. And in fact, the way that you should be interpreting these geometric speed limits is that it's a kind of an optimality criterion on your path. It's to do with how close to the geodesic is the path that your dynamics is following. And it doesn't really say anything more than that. That's about as, as good a physical intuition as, as we could get. That really, when you look at geometric speed limits, it's just to do with how far away from your, the optimal path is your, uh, is, the pa is your actual path that you're following. What that also means is that once you fix the dynamics, quantum speed limits by their very construction aren't really, like, they're all saturable, provided your, your dynamics follows the geodesic path for that metric. But most, <laughs> most open system dynamics will not follow a given metri uh, metrics geodesic path. So the, the saturability of quantum speed limits is kind of a little bit, I find a little bit shaky. But I'm going to skip over, over this, this notion of the action speed limits, um, just to say that I because I want to, um, so, I just want to finish on the one last little bit of work that we did to do with the, on open systems. So the, the main thing on these action speed limits was just that, that argument about the, the optimality of the path. I think there's um, how you interpret ge geometric speed limits needs to be a little bit more carefully, carefully done in terms of uh, just because of this sort of infinity of different metrics that you can pick. But very, very recently, we, we were asking sort of similar enough, like, I've been thinking a little bit about like, what do these quantum speed limits really mean in a kind of practical sense? Um, and what was famously came up a couple of years ago was um, using this geometric approach, 
they were able to, to define classical versions of quantum speed limits. So remember, how the geometric quantum speed limits are defined is just in terms of distances. I have a, a state, I'm going from point A to point B, the distance between them, I can e perfectly well define that classically as well as quantum mechanically. So that distance, they use the same basic machinery and they define classical speed limits. And the argument then was that there's not so much quantum about quantum speed limits after all. So we were interested in asking, well, what does it actually mean when a quantum speed limit vanishes? Because if you look, again, I like to go back to the original, uh, like Mandelstam, Tam, Margos Leventon uh, quantum speed limit bounds. What you see there is there's a H bar. Once there's a H bar, bloody thing is quantum. <laughs> and so the rationale always was that, you know, these things come from quantum mechanics. The Mandelstam Tam makes it very clear it's to do with the uncertainty principle. H bar is there, this thing is damn well quantum. Um, so how do you interpret whenever a quantum speed limits vanish? Because then you have this whole geometric approach, which you know sort of negates the quantumness of it. So that's really what we did in this in this more recent paper. We tried to understand well what does it mean when bona fide quantum speed limits vanish? And it ended up I think being a very nice and sort of a reasonably insightful insightful way of, of viewing things. We we had to to, to work well I say we um, Pablo had to work a little bit to to. Uh, uh, develop a framework for studying Gaussian, Gaussian quantum speed limits. So for continuous variable systems, there's a bunch of issues. Um, but basically, by defining the right sort of fidelity for Gaussian states, you can define a quantum speed limit in that framework. And all we were interested in saying is, OK, for the quantum speed limit time to vanish, the corresponding speed must diverge. So if that's happening, is there something we can say meaningfully about classicality, because the argument should be that the when H bar vanishes, when the quantumness of my system disappears, then the quantum speed limit should go away as well. Bonafide quantum speed limit should vanish in, in that area. And we showed that that insight does, does, does still stand. So if you take something like the, we use the same geometric approach. You imagine I have a blob in phase space. So I have a Gaussian state just sitting here. What does it mean for that state to become distinguishable? If I want it to become fully distinguishable, I need this guy to move away from where this, this blob is. So they'd have, they have to live in different, different parts of phase space. So if I look at how quickly can I do that? So I, I do some little, little ramp here. If the blobs are this size, it'll take a while before they, before they become properly distinguishable. If I do the naive thing of reducing H bar, if I take the naive classical limit, what does that correspond to? That means reducing uncertainty in all of the observables here, just making it tighter in phase space. Now, the state can evolve to a, a distinguishable state faster. What we see here is that a diverging quantum speed, or correspondingly a vanishing speed limit time in this framework, goes hand in hand with, does go hand in hand with the, the, the vanishing of, of quantumness by increasing classicality, by decreasing H bar, you're basically going closer to classical systems, to point particles, you get uh, a diverging speed here. So there is a hand-in-hand a, a -hand notion of more classical in terms of reduced uncertainty, like the original, let's say, sort of motivation of speed limits, corresponds to, to, to a vanishing speed, quantum speed limit time. I think this was a nice insight, but a bit artificial because we're taking this limit of naive limit of H bar to zero. Much more interesting or much more, I think, sort of meaningful was when we looked at it for squeeze states. So you take squeeze states. What is a squeeze state? So I, I, I take my blob in phase space. So I have my P and Q quadrature. So this is just defined here in, in, in terms of these, these, these operators. If I squeeze it, I'm basically just reducing the uncertainty along one, one degree of freedom and increasing it along the other. These are extremely quantum states according to the, to, in the plane orthogonal to, to which you're doing the squeezing. So the more I squeeze in the P direction, the more quantum it becomes in the Q direction, essentially. So now play the same game. Look at my initial state, and I have a bit of squeezing. In order to make this state, the more distinguishable I want to make this state, the more, let's say, the longer, the, the bigger the time will need to be. I can ramp the system, uh, and it, it, like, in order to get it properly distinguishable, it'll take a, it'll take a while. Whereas if I do the same process, let's say the same ramping, but I take a more squeezed state, it will get distinguishable quicker precisely because 
you know, the uncertainty in this direction, it's, it's, it's thinner. It's thinner in that direction. If I do a little rotation, the thinner it is in this direction, the quicker I'll be able to get to a, to a distinguishable state. If it's infinitely squeezed in this direction, then I'll be able to get to, a, uh, to an orthogonal state, to a completely distinguishable state, essentially instantaneously. What does that correspond to when we think about it in terms of the uncertainty? Well, I have a massive amount of quantumness, a huge amount of uncertainty in this Q direction if I increase the, the, the squeezing. But that corresponds to a vanishing uncertainty in another quadrature, in the opposite direction. So what we actually have here is that we can understand the vanishing of genuine, of bona fide quantum speed limits as the emergence of classicality in at least a subset of, of observables. In the naive limit of h-bar going to zero, it's all observables. It's just everything, that, you know, you're making everything very classical. In the more, I think, sort of meaningful instance, you see that you get a vanishing speed limit by making classicality emerge at least in one particular direction for one property of the system. So we would argue that the bona fide speed limits, like the vanishing quantum speed limit times, really do herald a, a, a type of classicality, just a very specific, precise notion of it. So I just finished just to flash up to say that um, this notion of classicality at the level of the vanishing uncertainty, it's very in the spirit of the original uncertainty principle, I think. It's you know, very much so kind of what Mandelson and Tam and the, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty relation gets at. And this is fundamentally different from the notion of classicality that we associate to, to, open, to normal open systems. In open systems, we have uncertainty at the level of mixing of states. We have mixed states, and that's how it gets muddied. That is a very, very different type of classicality compared to vanishing uncertainty of certain observables. And so what I think our, our most recent paper kind of hints at is that there's, there, you know, there's really sort of two very different ways to look at how a system can be characterized as classical. Quantum speed limits by their nature are like inherently quantum and they do vanish when a certain type of classicality emerges. But equally, if I have an open system dynamics where I have a classical mixing, your quantum speed limits will never vanish in that instance because the classicality associated to it is, is very, very different. Um, we did some extra work in the direction of looking at it for, for um, in many body systems, but I leave it, I leave that for you guys to, to read in your own time. For now, just I think I'm, I'm basically out of time now, so I'm just going to thank, thank my guys, so the, my group, I have Owen Owen, and this is Anthony, or as I call him, not Owen, so when he gets a picture of a cat, then, then he'll get a name, um, but then a lot of this work then was done with Giacomo, Sebastian, Ricardo, and, and Pablo, so with that, uh, I, I thank you guys for your attention, apologize for running over a little bit, but uh, I'm happy if you have any, any questions or anything. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. So, questions? So, okay, Lucas raised his hand. So, Lucas, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Very nice talk. Actually, I have a plenty of questions, actually. Uh, but um, let us start with the last paper that you just showed. That in this, in, in the last but one slide, the orthogonal catastrophe paper. Uh -huh. um, but there, um, from what I got, you just uh, understand the orthogonal catastrophe in terms of quantum speed limited, and you use it the LMG model to understand this. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is. Uh, did, did you think about uh, dynamical quantum phase transitions? Especially this, because you worked with Ricardo, with Ricardo uh, Puebla. Yeah. No, in, in, the, in, in this case, in, in this one, no. Um, what we looked at for the for the orthogonality catastrophe here was just the, the large end limit in the... Well, we looked at two models, actually, in, in that paper. We look at the like a, a Fermi gas and the, mm -hmm. the LMG model. And we look at just the ground state starting from, I think, the... Probably from the gap, no, from the symmetric phase and quenching it across the phase transition. Okay, but uh, they use the linear phase transition. I mean, no, we did, we and we didn't look at anything like because also, like, what I love about the LMG model, you have this excited state phase transition as well, um, which happens like where the, the energy, yeah. like, 
or finite size systems are somewhere in the energy spectrum where the energy gap lifts. And I think you'll see some curious, actually, probably you'll see some curious effects in the, in the speed limit reflected there. If you look at dynamics where you quench either above or below or to the excited state phase transition. In fact, what we did, uh, yeah, actually in, in this paper, we tried to understand the emergence of the orthogonality catastrophe. So, I mean, what the orthogonality catastrophe says is essentially that the system will evolve into an, a, a completely distinguishable state, essentially instantaneously. Like for larger systems, they become completely distinguishable almost immediately. We show here, and in fact, we related with this most recent paper on the diverging speed limits that you can understand this, this whole, um, all of this from this kind of, uh, yeah, from, from the, 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 for, the LM, or the, for the LMG or for, for any many body system, provided the energy variance is extensive, which is what you find in one phase of, the, of this LMG model, but not in the other. If, the, if the, the variance is extensive, then almost it follows almost directly from just the Mandelson tan bound. So the fact that the Mandelson tan bound, the time to an orthogonal state, is one over the energy variance. If that quantity is extensive in the size of the system, you're guaranteed to get the orthogonality catastrophe. And in a lot of systems, oh, that's, that's what really happens. Interesting, actually. Hmm? Um, that, that's really interesting, actually. In, in which phase the, the, the variance is extensive in this model? So, in the in the in the LMG model in one phase, so in the I think in the symmetric phase where you have these these double degeneracies uh, when okay. you quench for the, for the quench like so we're doing like a strong kick. What you'll find is that the the variance and in fact you can kind of see it. If, you know, we're we're doing a little bit of work now. What, what I'm I'm playing with with Chrisia at the minute is looking at what the actual work distribution looks like when you kick a system. So what has been seen is. If I start in one phase and I kick it very strongly into the other phase, the distribution gets very, very broad. In fact, and it scales, oh. like, and the larger the system, the broader that distribution tends to be. And the fact that that happens then corresponds to, to when well, we see the orthogonality catastrophe kind of emerge from there. While what was kind of curious is on the other side, whenever we kicked it from the opposite phase, or if we kicked it kind of not strongly enough, you, you, didn't, you didn't see this extensive behavior. So the, the variance of the, of the energy was kind of just fixed. So it just, it, yeah, it didn't have a, a clear end dependence. So at least this was what we saw in, in this particular model. In the Fermi model um, that Mossy looked at, um, you kind of get this extensive scaling of the, of the variance kind of just drops out anyway for the, for the many body system. So it was nice to kind of, like our argument, like what we, what we tried to understand here was like we, reinterpreted really the the orthogonality catastrophe really just in terms of this exploding variance if you look at the the dynamical orthogonality catastrophe and you then look at just just look at the the energy variance of the system i think you you will necessarily find that that explodes and that's why the uncertainty principle or that's why the orthogonality catastrophe happens so you can kind of look at the the orthogonality catastrophe really just as a natural knock-on effect of the of the um, of the uncertainty principle or speed limit, if you will. So. Oh, but that that's really interesting. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So we tied it as well. I mean, I think if you look at the the recent the PRX quantum that we did here, um, we talk about the large end limit here as well for the for the continuous variable case, and we tie it in a little bit with this orthogonality catastrophe dis discussion. The fact that if you take a squeeze state like this, a little bit squeezed, and then you take a concatenation of like n times this guy, the total state becomes very squeezed, like a little bit of squeezing in one mode. It sort of scale again, that squeezing kind of scales. If I take 10 modes with the same level of squeezing, the, comp the, the overall state is very squeezed. And if I take a million of them, it's even more squeezed. Um, what you'll see then is that kind of large end limit kind of uh, follows on that you get the, 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 this, this diverging quantum speed limit, vanishing quantum speed limit times, which is essentially the same as the orthogonality catastrophe. The fact that large N corresponds to diverging speeds, again, in the, for, the same, for the same basic reasons. Okay, okay, I see what you mean. Hmm. Questions? Anyone? So if you want to make more questions, Lucas, feel free. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm still thinking about dynamic or quantum phase transition here because of, in relation to the, this thing that Steve just, I mean, mm. spoke. It's, um, mm. Because, you know, you know if, if we start in the ground stage and then going to the system, the dynamic or quantum phase transition occurs when the ground stage. Um, so there, there is a paper, I think, uh, Marcus Heidel, of course. Um, I think he has done something on dynamical phase transitions and speed limits. If I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, there is a paper, but I, I don't understand that paper, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you and me both. <laughs> I don't understand that paper. Um, but um, I, I would like to understand that these, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean in a more it should precise be. way. It should be calculable for yeah for a reasonably simple enough systems like for for the easing or for the LMG probably. Um, yeah, this, this is easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Because I mean, it it happen, it happens in a finite time, and it's when the system becomes the, the I mean, the system comes back to the ground state manifold. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it goes become become for top. Well, I don't, I don't know if it becomes very tall now, actually. But. No, I mean, I, what I imagine, okay, thinking on my feet, what, what must happen is if you see that, like, if, if a dynamical phase transition is characterized by the fact that the, the, the state reaches the, the, the ground state or reaches the, the ground state of the other phase and then comes back or something like this, I imagine when you don't see a dynamical phase transition, it's because the system can't reach that state. So probably if you calculate something like the quantum speed limit, there should be some, some when you don't see a, a dynamical phase transition, the, the speed limit should the speed limit time should probably diverge. So the Pro fact that probably, the, state, yeah. Yeah, probably, the yeah. state can't reach the fact that the state that their system can't reach that target state, then should correspond to an infinite speed limit time. So you should have a diverging speed limit time. But when it does happen, I guess it should become finite. There should be some sort of sharp crossover there, I would imagine. So maybe it should be possible to build a, a, a phase, a dynamical phase diagram based on the quantum speed limit. Well, I think this this is exactly, I mean, because I think if you look at what we did, like what I was talking about in the first part, where we talked about that control dynamics, if you ask the right question sort of of the dynamics using the speed limit, it does seem to drop out all of the interesting features you might want. So, I mean, you yeah. can study things like Kibble-Zurk scaling and other kind of uh, dynamical properties by looking at the speed limit, just looking at it in the right sort of way. So I would fully suspect yeah. you could probably get something something comparable. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah that's, true. that's true. Thanks, man. Sure. That's OK. So do we have more questions? No questions on YouTube. Um, yeah, you know, uh, this actually, this uh, the Nepo quantum phase tra transitions is, um, let's say, it's what I study in my PhD. And uh, one of our initial purpose for my PhD was, uh, you know, trying to answer the question how fast uh, the Nepo quantum phase transitions occur. And mm -hmm. we thought that uh, we could answer this question. Uh, using quantum speed limits, at least at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, this question seemed to be much more, you know, much harder than we thought. So, well, I, I okay, like, what way are you defining the 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 speed limit? I think this is one of one of the one of the things that is a little bit subtle uh, that I kind of tried to well sort of flash up there a little bit is you can for unitary dynamics you should just use the Fisher information, right? So I mean, for unitary dynamics, that's kind of the unique path that your system follows. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of right uh, one to use. However, you can define metrics using, you know, you can define, you can calculate the speed using any metric you want. So you can use a trace distance metric or whatever. Interpreting them gets a little bit trickier, but what we did in the, in the Kibble Zurich stuff, we didn't use the Fisher information because it wouldn't work. You had to use the trace distance. And this is, I mean, it's a little technical, but essentially the fact that our, our control dynamics always was tracking the, uh, the, the instantaneous 
the instantaneous ground state, you're always essentially on the unitary dynamics of the bare Hamiltonian, meant that you couldn't probe any of the interesting, the, the, the competition between the, the control Hamiltonian and the, the bare Hamiltonian. You were just sort of seeing the properties of the underlying bare Hamiltonian. By taking the trace distance, this guy was sensitive to the different competing energy scales at play. It was like, but the fact that the geodesic path that the trace distance wants the system to follow was um, uh, is not the, the 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 unitary path that the that the the system was actually following. That was enough to sort of see the trade off between the energy that the, you're investing from the control and the energy that you're getting from the just from the bare bare ramp. And that competition was vital for getting that scaling. So. I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is that when you're studying something like the dynamical phase transitions or some sort of process like this, you have an entire infinity family of different metrics to pick or different speed limits to define. Which one you choose, I think, will, de will determine what kind of features are revealed. So I think this, like I say, the, the, the correct one, if you're looking, talking about actual speed limit times is something like the Fisher information but it doesn't necessarily probe all of the different features that, that you have going on. I think picking one of the other, like a, a different metric to calculate it in, re, in, in relation to might reveal something a little bit more, maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So any questions? No, okay. So uh, I want to thank you again, Steve for the acceptance of the invitation. It was a great pleasure. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. No, no it was an absolute pleasure. So um, hopefully I'll see you in person in, in Brazil in the not so distant future, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Hope to see you again soon, man. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much for the talk. No, of course. Anytime. Any anything, any questions or anything you guys have, just you know, feel free to follow up at any point. So. Yes. Okay. Please send my regards to John and, and Gabriel. Oh, I will. Don't worry. We'll be out for pints this weekend. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Ciao. Okay. See you. Bye. 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 Ciao.